you see anyone? No, I just see you. Chris, stop it! I'll deal with it. This week on At The Movies, an exclusive early review of Lakeview Terrace, starring Samuel L. Jackson. Put the gun down! Wow. She is strong. An all-star female cast heads up the women. Is this the perfect date movie, or is it ladies only? Plus our DVD out now list and three to see. I'm not the most dangerous thing out there. It's all next on After Movies. Give up the wallet, man. Give it up. Welcome to the neighborhood. What? Never roll your window down when somebody does that. <sighs> Scared the hell out of me. Imagine that. You do not want Samuel L. Jackson as your next door neighbor, although I think I'd like to go play golf with him. I'm Ben Lyons of E! Entertainment. And I'm Ben Mankiewicz of Turner Classic Movies. We'll start off with a big early review of our first movie, Lakeview Terrace. The movie opens with a compelling premise. Sam Jackson plays Abel Turner. He's a single police officer raising his two kids in a suburban L.A. neighborhood. When a mixed-race couple moves next door, Turner doesn't like it. I need you to back off. Back off. Yeah, a little. Or what? So you keep saying stuff like that, like we're, we're not welcome here, we should move. But we're fitting in just fine. Says who? And Samuel L. Jackson can flat out Thank play you. scary. For the first half of this movie, there's this wonderful sense of foreboding doom. You fear Abel's next power play to force the couple, played by Kerry Washington and Patrick Wilson, to move. And they can't go anywhere for help because Abel's the law. There are no rules. Abel. We make them up as we go along. Is that right, Lisa? I am right, aren't I? You've made huh? your point, Abel. Whatever we want to do, that's all right, right? Enough. How you say it, baby girl? Get off my property. Or what? You want to call the cops? Here. I'll tell you who's on duty. The movie is directed by Neil LeBute, whose history suggests he's comfortable making his audience just uncomfortable enough to make a lasting impression. But right where Lakeview Terrace is ready to take a step into largely unexplored territory, it transforms itself into a stalker movie we've all seen a dozen times. It also has the feel of a movie scaled back to a PG-13 rating. But I really think this needed to be a grown-up movie with grown-up themes, which ultimately it isn't. Now, all of that said, Sam Jackson is very good and very scary, and I was tense through three quarters of this movie, so ultimately I am gonna give it a qualified see it. I'm gonna have to say rent it for the same reasons though. It started off great, it was something I hadn't really seen before, and then you're right, it turned into almost like a Disturbia type of movie. I love Kerry Washington yep. in anything, and Sam Jackson is scary at times, but at also at times he's Sam Jackson, so it's kind of funny. You never really notice editing in a film unless it's poor, right, and here some of the scenes and some of the shots lasted a beat or two too long, I think. One of my big problems, I mentioned it there, was the PG-13 rating. I mean, Neil LeBute, the guy who brought us in the company of men, this guy will put pressure on an audience. And Sam Jackson is a scary guy, ready to become violent if it means getting his way. And I believe the main four-letter word that everybody's afraid of was only used twice. They're scaling this back for a wider audience. And the fact is, there's no 13-year-old kid who probably ought to see this movie. This is right. for grown-ups. Absolutely, it's for grown-ups because it does tackle issues of race relations, yeah. issues of, of domestic abuse, issues of, you know, I love how it brings up sort of Sam Jackson's past and how he's dealing with yeah. raising two kids on his own without a wife who he lost. And I, I found it scary at times, and I was tense, and I was on the edge of my seat. But ultimately, it did spiral out of control and get a little ridiculous. There's yeah. too many holes in it for me to really go out there and say, you have to see this movie. I almost would have rather seen it as a play. And I know Neil LeBute is a great and talented yep. playwright, it's and I would have liked to have seen it on the stage as opposed to on the screen. With about 28 minutes left, all of a sudden you realize, oh, I know what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, surfing movies have played well with audiences the last few years. From the Oscar-nominated Surf's Up to the biggest documentary in the history of Australia, Bra Boys. The genre was long overdue, however, for a stinker, and it's found one with Surfer Dude starring a shirtless <laughs> the entire movie, I kid you not, Matthew McConaughey. And it's something that Addington has been so mad passionate about for, like, ever. Stickers can put it on anything, you know, your uh, television, surfboard, your wall, your laptop, your dog. 
shave it. Okay. Now, I think the make it up as it goes along plot centers around Matthew McConaughey's character, Steve Addington, a legendary surfer who was approached to be on a reality show. But I can't be sure, because every time the story moves forward, it's interrupted by meaningless montages of big waves, topless pool parties, and random appearances from Woody Harrelson, Scott Glenn, and Willie Nelson that serve no purpose other than to add some much-needed star power. Want to paddle out? It's been a while. <laughs> I'd best be about me father's business. <laughs> me too, brother. Me too. What goes down? Gotta come up. The film looks more like a collection of home movies as opposed to a professional piece of cinema and was obviously just an excuse for McConaughey to go surfing all day with his buddies. So alas, the endless summer or point break even, this is not, I say skip it. What was Scott Glenn doing in the movie? What was his character? What was going on? How many times can you say dude and bra in a movie? I think I might have liked it less than you. It didn't even seem finished. No, there's no heart to this film. And the great surfing movies from documentaries like Riding yeah, Giants right. or Endless Summer have heart to them. And you realize the passion that these guys have in their lives and for riding waves and friendship and brotherhood. And this was kind of just like shot on a little camera, like almost a music video for an hour and a half. It felt like we were watching a rough cut. Uh, I was baffled through much of it. I didn't understand. I mean, I hate to even say this, but I really didn't understand anyone's motivation. The main plot point involves him participating in a reality show, and I kept thinking all along, just do it. Yeah, you wanted him to go <laughs> yeah. and do the reality show. Of course, it's fun to look at beautiful people in beautiful locations, but there's no movie here. There's no story. There's no semblance of character or motivation. If you really want to break it down on that level, this film's not really even worthy of that. No, there were some goats that I'm showed up. Yeah, there were some goats <laughs> I don't in know there. What was going on. Ultimately, this thing is a complete mess. Easy call. Coming up next, from the Oscar winning writer of American Beauty comes the controversial drama Towelhead. And later, our Critics Roundup takes on Meg Ryan, Matt Benning, and Eva Mendez in The Women. Mary is a friend of ours. You better stop it. Keep going. Zira. Gil said he saw you in Mr. Ruoso's car last night. I wasn't in his car. You know, any man who wants to be friends with a girl your age is a pig. I wasn't in his car. Okay, next movie. Before the frame of Oscar winner Alan Ball's Towelhead, the title gives you a pretty good idea the film intends to be provocative. What you won't know until after you see it is how exceptional this movie is. It's the story of Jazeera, a beautiful 13-year-old Lebanese-American girl experiencing a sexual awakening while living with her strict father in Houston. The performances, most notably from Summer Bashil, who plays Jazeera, are memorable. Aaron Eckhart deserves praise for taking and masterfully playing a role that will make many very uncomfortable. I'm not your daughter. I'm your girlfriend. You're too young to be my girlfriend. No, I'm not. You did that thing to me. I'm your girlfriend. And that's really one of the great things about Towelhead. This movie will challenge you on a number of levels, including some beliefs you never thought you'd question. The story is powerful without a false note. The racism subtle but real and complicated. You would be doing yourself a huge disservice if you don't see it. Ben, your thoughts? I couldn't disagree with you more, Ben. I did feel uncomfortable. It wasn't enjoyable on any level. I knew there was a movie in there somewhere. The story of a young Lebanese girl coming into her own as a woman, living in a racist Texas town. I was ready to see that film. When you throw in child molestation into the mix, and when you throw in beating into the mix, that was unnecessary for me. I didn't need that. Those things aren't thrown in to sort of get a rise out of the audience. That's what the movie's about. It's incredibly disturbing to the point where I didn't it was just a screen anymore. It was disturbing, but it made you think I found it incredibly impressive and I thought she's good in the film but she's a little sheltered and a little quiet and I didn't see the relationship with her boyfriend as something that really opened her up to the world on any level I, I think her boyfriend was extraneous to it she was coming into her own whether the boyfriend was from his point of view lucky enough to be there the one thing I do agree with you about is that I do praise Aaron Eckhart for taking on a challenging role especially coming off the heels of Batman playing Harvey Dent to now kind of switch gears and play this character that's really commendable as an actor however like I said it's so disturbing 
disturbing and uncomfortable to watch that it's really difficult to find it somewhat enjoyable on any level at the movie. There was one scene that was unquestionable, two scenes that were unquestionably very difficult to watch. To me, they challenged me. They had me reevaluate things because on what one level... reevaluate? If a young girl is raped, yes, her life is going to be difficult. That I mean, scene wasn't tough to reevaluate. And you said the racism was subtle. It wasn't subtle at all. People are throwing out some pretty derogatory terms no, but back there was, and forth. But there was some uh, reverse racism and uh, and also there was some there was a lot of presumption of people's beliefs based on how they looked i thought that was subtle and impressive coming up next will the women be meg ryan's return to box office heights the critics roundup weighs in i'm eating for two oh for crap oh my eating god what, what's happening it is knocked up again Oof. I want to keep going until I get a boy. Don't we have enough of those? Here's the thing about our next film, The Women. I think you're supposed to like the women. And I didn't. And that ruins everything yeah. when the movie is about the, the women. I am so sorry that I won't be able to stay longer but my water just broke. It's the story of a wealthy New York society woman, Mary Haynes, played by Meg Ryan. She's rich but unfulfilled, though she doesn't realize it. Stephen, it took forever to plan this trip, and we both really need a vacation. Yet, yeah, no, there has to be some way. When she learns her wealthy New York Society husband is having an affair with the ferocious Eva Mendez, her three closest friends, Annette Benning, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Deborah Messing, help her through it. Problem is, I wouldn't want these particular characters helping me with anything. You knew, and you didn't tell me? Right now, honest to God, Mary, I'm so hurt. You? Yeah. No, this isn't happening Mary. to you. This is happening to me. Ultimately, the story and dialogue feel contrived to set up allegedly clever lines. There's not a single man in the cast. They are discussed but never seen, as was the case in the original Broadway show and the classic 1939 film adaptation. That version is worth seeing again and again. This is not. Skip it. Those are my thoughts. Let's go to our new feature, The Critics' Roundup opening it up to expert views and opinions from across the country. From IFC, we have Matt Singer. From Reels Channel, Tori Shulman. And from the Boston Globe, Wesley Morris. Welcome back, guys. And of course, uh, here with me, uh, Ben Lyons. All right, thoughts on the women. Wesley, we'll begin with you. See it, skip it, or rent it? Oh, God, I have to say skip it. <laughs> it's a skipper. Uh, mostly, I mean, it's like, it's like the worst episode of Sex in the City on Lifetime. <laughs> all right, Tori Shulman in uh, Hollywood, uh, representing all women. All the women here, I'm here, but ladies, skip it. It's the boring guy at the end of the bar you don't want to see at the end of the night, trust me. All right, not to suggest that Matt Singer is that boring guy at the end of the bar, <laughs> but Matt, what are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, all the best parts of this movie are taken directly out of the 1939 original, and there aren't that many of them at all, so skip it. All right, we're 0 for 4, Ben. <laughs> About to be 0 for 5. I love women in real life, but at the movies, I hated the women. I say skip it. You know, I'm a, a huge fan, guys, of Annette Bening. I think with Edie Falco, she is among uh, one of the two or three best working American actresses now. And I... I, I hated her in this. I can't imagine that she find, that she would put this anywhere near the top of uh, top of the list of her best work. I would just say that I, I sort of agree that it's not her best work, but she's actually sort of interesting in the movie. I mean, if there was something that I could cling to as any sign of a remotely entertaining people watching this movie, it's probably her. And that's only because her face is, has lines on it. It has. A, she's got a normal woman's face. Yeah, I give her credit. I, for, I give her credit were... for having lines on her face. I just. Uh, <laughs> I, I was so excited to see it, literally because of Annette Bening, uh, and uh, the performance overall disappointed me. Although, again, I felt uh, I, I don't want to hang it totally on her. I thought we had an inadequate script and oh my inadequate God, by chemistry no and an inadequate story. No, yeah. definitely not her fault. But it's also insulting to assume that it's just the women will be the chick flick because it's just the women. I find that chick flicks or chicks like me will be bored. Will be find this very disingenuous. Will find. The character's very character-like. I didn't connect to anyone except for a two-second cameo with Bette Midler, who got a clap at the end of our audience because she's the only one that tapped into sort of a realistic approach to funny. I agree. There's nothing realistic about a film called The Women where they don't interact with men ever. I get it. That's the point of the movie. But go to a restaurant and have a male waiter, something, I mind, right? I didn't mind that as much. I just minded that it was so broad 
I couldn't get into it at all. Matt, let me ask you this, because I, I know that you're a fan of the original George Cukor 1939 version. That didn't have any men either, but this somehow in this version, it felt inauthentic. It felt contrived. It, it did. The first movie is, you know, all set on, in studios on sound stages, so no one ever has to go outside, which we see Meg Ryan outside on a New York City street hailing a cab, and there's right. only women around her. It's like a weird science fiction movie that no one <laughs> wants to great. address, like all the men in the entire us. world have disappeared. That whole aspect of it doesn't add anything. Thing, and I think it detracts a lot because you go, where are the men? They yeah, keep talking about these guys. Let's see yeah, them. Let's, yeah. let's see what's so good or bad about these people. There's a depth to Sex in the City with the men and the relationships that you don't have here with just the women. Right. I agree. Tori, thank you for the segue. Will this movie capitalize on the success of Sex in the City? What do you think? Absolutely not. I think uh, you're, you're putting the standard too low for women there if you can't tell the difference between the two. <laughs> At least with Carrie, I giggled. Ben, Absolutely, yeah. Audiences well, are a lot know, more perceptive than this. They see four women on a poster, and they're not going to ultimately no. assume that it's sex it's in the city. That's right. It really looks down at a lot of women, I yeah, thought. I mean, if you're a character, theory. if you're a person like Meg Ryan or Annette Bening, maybe you can relate, but they actually look down on Ava Mendez's Please. character and Debbie Mazar's character. If Who you're b below a certain hair, age. Like Meg Ryan, my God, no woman has those Botticelli and Well, there's girls. a the problem with the movie also is that it's, it, there's a class problem, which is that all the women that we're supposed to be relating to and rooting for are these very snobby, very obnoxious, uh, materialistic, upper middle class women. We definitely have a consensus. We say skip it and we say it five times. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you joining us. All right. Next up, all star duos team up. From belly laughs to flying kicks, there's something for everyone on our DVD out now list. He's got no gung fu. Help! Help! None. Help! It's time to take a look at a few movies and TV shows out now on DVD. Saturday Night Live stars Tina Fey and Amy Poehler team up on the big screen for Baby Mama. Jet Li enters the Forbidden Kingdom with Jackie Chan. Jeff Bridges and John Goodman star in an all-time classic, the 10th anniversary edition of The Big Lebowski, and a very funny TV show, season three of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. My DVD pick is season one of Pushing Daisies, as quirky, clever, and offbeat a show as TV has seen in years. Lee Pace, who my wife tragically describes as hunky, is Ned, possessed since childhood with the ability to bring the dead back to life. Among the people he brings back is his boyhood sweetheart, a girl named Chuck. Do you know what's happening right now? I had the strangest dream. I was being strangled to death with a plastic sack. You were strangled to death with a plastic sack. That's probably an odd thing to hear, but I wasn't quite sure how to sugarcoat it. Unfortunately, bringing back the dead has a downside. If he touches those he saves again, they die forever. It's tremendous pressure. And it's actually a rare reason to stay in and not go to the movies. My DVD pick this week is Young at Heart, which premiered at this year's Sundance Film Festival. Profiling the Young at Heart chorus of Northampton, Massachusetts, whose average age is 81 years young, the chorus travels the globe singing hit songs from the likes of The Ramones, James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, and Outkast. Full of life, passion, and dedication to their craft, the chorus members are a joy to watch on screen, especially my great uncle Steve Martin, who just happened Happens to be one of the singers, and of course, in true Uncle Steve fashion, steals the movie. It's a foot stomping, hand clapping kind of thing. The audience will love it. We love it. Jeez, I love doing it. You know, it's got a lot of life. That's what we have a lot of life. Your uncle is Steve Martin? A different Steve Martin. This is my uncle from Massachusetts, and he's the guy with the convertible in the film, and he's fantastic. Uh, Young at Heart is terrific, and I, did, I didn't know Uncle Steve was even in it. <laughs> so both the Pushing Daisy Season 1 DVD and Young at Heart will be in stores on Tuesday. Coming up next, what's worth your time this weekend? Find out in our 3 to see. And you've heard our reviews. What do you have to say? Give us your take on atthemoviestv.com. Closed captioning for At The Movies is sponsored by... Use the movie ticket stock card. It's fast, easy, and painless. Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. All right, let's recap the movies on this week's show. I say rent it for Lakeview Terrace, and Ben says to see it. It opens next week. We both say you can stay out of the water and skip Surfer Dude. Definitely. We split on Towelhead. I say see it. Ben says skip it. The Roundup agreed on the women. You should definitely skip it. 
Now it's time for three to see. My number three pick, I'm going to keep the heat on to get people to see Hamlet 2. I think it's wonderfully offbeat, skillfully written, and really expertly performed, if occasionally overbroad, but principally by legendary British TV star Steve Coogan. And if I'd said it once, I'll say it a hundred times, I'll see any movie set in Tucson. My three to see pick this week is everything related to Twilight. Go online, check out the trailer, go read the books. If you haven't heard about Twilight, the time is now because since Harry Potter got pushed to 09, Twilight will be hitting theaters earlier in mid-November. At number one, we talked about it during the show, but you must see Towelhead. It is a smart, focused story with rich, fully developed characters. And I think come December, we'll stand out as one of the best movies of the year. You clearly and obviously disagree. I guess you're the one. All right, and that's it for now. Remember, we're always online at atthemoviestv.com. And we'll leave you with a look at movies we'll review next week, including Viggo Mortensen, Renee Zellweger, and Ed Harris in Appaloosa. Until then, we'll be at the movies. I'm the new city marshal. You're a dead man. You ain't got no jurisdiction up here. Jurisdiction? Hey, you got a sec? I'm gonna hit you up for a favor. I don't feel well. Desmond! The doctor will see you now. It's fruit crepe fever. Sweet cream cheese, luscious fruit, and delectable crepes. Only at IHOP. Come hungry, leave happy. Wasteful. Washable. The reusable, machine washable Wonder Mop. Only from Libman. From Jennifer, a $2.99 dual reclining sofa. That's right, $2.99. A dual reclining sofa. Only at Jennifer. Hi, welcome to Progressive.com. Come on in and I'll give you a free quote. Quote and compare in about eight minutes. Now that's Progressive. Call or click today.